Our next guest speaker is Dr. Frederick Amant. He's a leading specialist in gynecological oncology, professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Leuven, Belgium, and a specialist in gynecologic oncology in UZ Gasthusberg. He has been described by The Lancet as, the leading, as leading the agenda on cancer in pregnancy. Dr. Amant is a principal investigator of an international study on cancer in pregnancy and lead author of the recent series on malignancy in pregnancy published in The Lancet and Lancet Oncology, which presented new evidence on the treatment of cancer during pregnancy. He is also chair of the task force on the Europe, of the European Society of Gynecological Oncology on Cancer in Pregnancy, a member of the Endometrium Tumor Site Committee of the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, Gynecologic Cancer Group, and co-chair of the European Network Individualized Treatment Endometrial Cancer. We are delighted to have Dr. Amant here today with us to discuss the subject of cancer treatment during pregnancy, evidence for maternal and fetal safety. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you for this very nice introduction. Thank you uh, for being here. It's an honor uh, for me to, to be able to present our data on uh, maternal and fetal safety um, in Dublin, Ireland. Thank you. Um, during this lecture, I will give a short introduction and I will basically give you an idea of the possibilities we have to treat cancer patients during pregnancy. But the main focus will be on the pregnancy outcome, follow-up of children, and the, and the maternal safety, so the maternal prognosis. Yearly, more than 5 million children are born in Europe, and when we know that cancer complicates pregnancy in about 1 in 1,000, 22,000 cases, then it is estimated that in Europe this problem occurs in about 2,500 to 5,000 children. So, um, actually, a nice important number, and for some of you, more important or higher than what you may have expected. The problem is also likely to increase. In most countries, including the Flemish data, we see that um, women are getting older when they, they conceive, and we know from the right slide that as persons become older, the chance to have a cancer increases. So it suggests that at least the problem is not likely to decrease. In our European registry um, that now contains more than 600 cases, uh, breast cancer is the most common cancer, uh, dealing with 42% of all uh, malignancies, followed by hematological cancers and by cervical cancer. Regarding uh, staging and um, diagnosis, it is important that, for example, the most common cancer, like breast cancer, that none of these cancers is screen detected. It is always by physical examination. And the pregnant state makes that there are many physiological alterations, including at the level of the breast, that actually makes an early diagnosis less likely. You see at the left, a woman with advanced breast cancer, she already has significant visible lymph nodes axillary. And also on the right, you see a right breast cancer on, on the MRI, you see that it's actually already a large nodule. So it's important for clinicians to look carefully into complaints because all, most cancers, they are actually detected in a later stage when compared to non-pregnant women. The only exception is actually cervical cancer because a woman has no complaints and she gets a regular gynecological examination on the, at the occurrence of her early pregnancy. So cervical cancer is the only cancer where actually relatively to uh, non-pregnant women, um, earlier stages are diagnosed. Before we go into the consequences on surgery, radiotherapy, radiation and imaging, and uh, chemotherapy on the pregnancy, it is important that we uh, look into the pregnancy and that we, uh, that we see at what gestational stage that actually these examinations or treatments are performed. And as you know, pregnancy can be divided actually into three stages. We have the uh, first days of pregnancy, and when there is any toxicity at that level, um, the influence on the pregnancy results in an all-or-nothing phenomenon. 
these cells are still omnipotent. So if a few cells only are deleted by any toxic event, then the remaining omnipotent cells are able to cover and uh, to continue the pregnancy, and this will result in a normal outcome. In contrast, when the toxicity is, uh, kills too many of these omnipotent cells, the few remaining cells are not able to cope with this, and this results in a miscarriage. The most vulnerable phase is until 10 weeks. This is the organogenesis, and actually any exposure may, or the pregnancy is most likely to suffer from any exposure at this level. As you can see, if you expose all kinds of chemotherapy, the increase in congenital anom anomalies is evident and is estimated to be by 17%. If you exclude the folate antagonists, then it's about 6%, which is probably double what you would expect in the background population. Regarding radiotherapy or radiation exposure, we have to keep in mind a threshold dose of 10 centigrade. Above this dose, problems may occur, including intrauterine growth retardation and defects of the central nervous system. However, below this level, it is not so likely that any problem occurs. After the organogenesis, the severity of symptoms of impact on the fetus is much less. There are publications on intrauterine growth retardation, but not always. There are indications of more premature birth. I will show you that later on. And mainly in the older literature, but not in the recent literature, intrauterine death has been described. We have to, be, to, to say also that regarding to radiotherapy, that there is a slight increase in adolescent leukemia. Although the absolute numbers are low, it appears that there is a slight uh, increase. Taking this into consideration, we believe that most of these exam or chemotherapy at least, that we can give this after this organogenesis and taking into consideration, let's say, a safety window, we consider it safe to give chemotherapy after 14 weeks of gestational age. We believe that cancer women who are pregnant, that they should be staged and treated actually as close as to the standard uh, regimen, including the staging examinations. It is important that in order to reduce as much as possible the radiation exposure to the child or the fetus, that we use sonography or MRI in order to decrease this. However, as you can see here, if any radiation examination is needed, it is possible to do this. This slide or this table gives you an overview of the fetal exposure per examination that is done. And again, we have to keep in mind this threshold dose of 10 centigrade. And then you can appreciate from this slide that actually in all these examinations, we are well below this threshold dose. For example, a CT scan of the pelvis comes quite close to this threshold dose. So that's why we should absolutely try to uh, not to do this. But all the other examination, if it's needed, you can do it. And if it's needed to treat your patient, and it's, if it's likely that it will change your clinical practice, we believe patient deserves this examination. Also, the use of uh, radioactive technetium, which is used for vulvar cancer or which is used for breast cancer, appears to be safe for the child. This results from these publications. Um, 18 millibecquerel technetium was injected and resulted in a fetal exposure of 0.05 milligray. Actually, again, you have to compare this to the threshold dose of 100 milligray, so it's quite far below this. The reason is that this 18 uh, millibecquerel is actually quite low dosage and that 90% of the technetium is captured in the axillary node and actually decays before it's released from the lymph node. But also in vulvar cancer, um, it appears to be possible. So uh, although it's quite much closer to the fetus, if you uh, calculate this, the fetal exposure levels appear to be far below uh, the threshold level. During pregnancy, we do not, re do not recommend the use of patent blue because in rare cases, you can have an allergic reaction. And of course, the treatment of a severe allergic reaction during pregnancy may jeopardize the fetal chances. Regarding to surgery, Overall, we have a vast experience of operating on pregnant women, not always, and in the majority of cases, not for malignant disease, but actually the same rules apply. The most important is to look for your mother, and if you care for your mother, you will care for your fetus. So adequate ox oxygenation and position in the lateral left position is important during pregnancy. 
depending on the gestational age and depending on the local policy, monitoring of the fetus and the contractions are possible. You can see at the right below that together with the mother, the fetus is also sleeping. Just some examples of the clinic. This was a case of breast cancer. This is a patient with um, early cervical cancer. You see in white the cervical cancer, which is quite superficially. This patient received in a first step a um, lymphadenectomy in order to make sure that she's low risk for advanced stage disease. And subsequently, she received an amputation of the cervix. Mother and child are actually doing well. This is a case with an ovarian mass. You can appreciate the fetus next to the fetus, the mass with increased vascularization. We can appreciate here on MRI the left humeral adnexe, sharply delineated, lobulated. However, no uh, invasion of the uh, surrounding tissues. And these are specimens from during surgery. You can appreciate the pregnant uh, uterus at the left on the top. It appeared to be a stage one, grade one, this herminoma. Standard treatment is no adjuvant chemotherapy, which was, of course, not applied in this patient, similar to non-pregnant patients. If this patient would have needed taxol carboplatin, for example, when it was a grade three, we would have done so. Regarding radiotherapy, two slides. Radiotherapy of the upper parts of the abdomen seems to be safe. And this is basically based on a publication by Mazonakis, who used a phantom model. And based on uh, increase of the pregnant uterus, they calculated actually the fetal exposure. And based on this, you can, uh, or they estimated that the larger the, the, the uterus grows, the closer it comes to the irradiated body parts. So, and as the more that the, uh, the uterus grows, the closer the fetus come and the larger the exposure. So a third trimester is probably not safe, but radiotherapy for brain tumors, thyroid cancer, Hodgkin disease, breast cancer, during the first or the second part of pregnancy appears to be possible. You see a picture from uh, colleagues from uh, the Netherlands, and you see actually the LED screen that protects the fetus from the radiation for a patient with breast cancer in the adjuvant setting. This is a patient from our clinic. Um, we see in the upper two parts, we see actually a phantom. We take the biometry of the patient and we estimate the expected fetal exposure, and it appeared to be well below the threshold dose. And below we see the patient with tongue cancer. She received a hemiglosectomy. Lymph nodes were removed, but she had positive lymph nodes, so she was irradiated. Um, and we see the patient lying with fetal protection. And two years later, even fetus and or the child and the mother are doing well. This patient received eight hours surgery during the first trimester of pregnancy to remove actually half of her tongue and the lymph nodes. Regarding chemotherapy, when we started the study, there were little data on how, which fraction of chemotherapy actually passes the placenta. So we initiated a study, and of course this cannot be done in a human setting. So we chose a model that is very close to the human setting, and we went to Kenya and, uh, in the baboon, pregnant baboon model. So here we see researchers who put a pregnant baboon asleep, and we give chemotherapy, and at the same time we measure the blood, the maternal blood, we do cordosynthesis to estimate the fraction of chemotherapy that actually passes to the fetus. This slide or this table uh, summarizes the data um, for several types of chemotherapy. And you can see that doxorubicin, ipirubicin, which are used for breast cancer, actually passes in four, or the, the Fraction that passes is 4 to 7 percent, which is quite low. But in some other fetuses, it was below the level of detection. So carboplatin, 57 percent. But paclitaxel, docetaxel, which are very commonly used also in breast cancer, gynecological cancer, they hardly cross 0 percent, 1 percent. And other drugs, 25 and 18 percent. So the main conclusion of these studies is that the placenta filters placenta, uh, cytotoxic drugs. Regarding co-drugs, we believe that all drugs can be given, although we have to admit that the evidence for safety is not, that, or that the evidence is not so clear always. Uh, nevertheless, in the studies that I will show you now, all these patients also received many of these um, co-medications. And actually, we use the same co-medications only when the patient has complaints. We believe that the chemotherapy 
is diluted in pregnant patients, they frequently have less side effects, so the need for co-drugs is less uh, important when compared to non-pregnant women. If you, we need to use it, we can use the same drugs, only for steroids we have to make an exemption, and we would only favor prednisolone or hydrocortisone because they are metabolized in the placenta. In contrast, dexamethasone or betamethasone, they cross the placenta and the repeated use and fetal exposure may actually on the long term lead to cognitive problems. Regarding the pregnancy outcome, um, first publication of our group was in 2010, and this analyzes in 215 uh, women, gestational age at delivery in, uh, in patients, in 180 patients was 36 weeks. In 71% there was an induction of labor or cesarean section in a majority of cases for oncological reasons, so 77%. Um, and we appreciate from these studies that actually during pregnancy um, the percentage of preterm labor for the whole group was 4.4%, which is close to the 4% background rate. But in patients getting chemotherapy, it was definitely higher. And also there was a trend for more PPROM in patients getting chemotherapy when compared to, to older patients. So there is definitely a need for close obstetrical surveillance. However, preeclampsia, sepsis, or intrauterine growth retardation were not importantly increased in this group. The neonatal outcome... 46% um, were major, so the majority of uh, pregnancies were actually terminated or delivered uh, prematurely at a mean gestational age of 36 weeks. Due to this policy, 50% of children had to be admitted to the neonatal care unit mainly because of prematurity. And you will see later on that this is actually has important consequences. Birth weight, actually, we had more um, small for just intrauterine growth retardation, nearly 15%, and we see that this was related also to tumor type. So it was mainly hematological cancers that actually had intrauterine growth retardation. And apart from the tumor type, it was actually the treatment modalities. We see that in the uh, lower than the 10th percentile, children more frequently had uh, treatment, and this was mainly chemotherapy. So it means that for, in our series, chemotherapy, especially in hematological cancers, may lead to intrauterine growth retardation. So also for that, a close obstetrical surveillance is needed. When we looked in the, do the uh, malformations, congenital malformations, the major, mal major uh, malformations are uh, in red. And you can see already that these are no new or very special malformations. These are the malformations we also see in the general population. And then we look into the uh, patients with chemotherapy. We have hip supplication and rectal atresia, um, but also major malformations in patients that did not receive chemotherapy. So from these data and from other data, we do not believe that if you give chemotherapy after uh, 40, the first trimester, that there is no increase in congenital malformations. 16th of August, this study was put online on, in the Lancet Oncology, and it is a collaborative study of the German breast group and our study, also dealing with the uh, obstetrical outcome in breast cancer patients. We had a, a large group of patients, 343 women with breast cancer during pregnancy, um, and this table gives an overview of the maternal mo uh, morbidity, uh, the obstetrical uh, consequences, and actually there were in patients with chemotherapy, there were actually no more problems when compared to women uh, who did not receive chemotherapy, although, and this is depicted in red, we see more or less the same tendency with regarding to uh, P-PROM and P-TERM labor. So also in this study, uh, it appears that the, we should take uh, care um, from obstetrical point of view for these women. In this study, there was also, um, and this is depicted in the curve at the top, um, that in women with chemotherapy, the birth weight, when corrected for gestational age, was lower in uh, pregnant women. However, there was no increase of in intrauterine growth retardation. Um, so that adds to the safety. The following uh, 
slides deal with our study that was published in uh, February in Lancet Ecology on the long-term cognitive and cardiac outcomes in children that in mothers that received um, chemotherapy. More than I expected, this study had actually an enormous impact in, in the world. And this just gives you an, an idea of the news and the, uh, the reports all over the world that get this, this study. And the reason is mainly that, um, and actually we were not so aware of it, that pregnant women are always very protected. And a pregnant woman can't do that, and she can't eat that, and she has to be careful for that. And then suddenly chemotherapy that kills all these rapidly dividing cells is actually possible. So this um, many or many sites actually um, took our message over. So I will shortly go into detail in this international collaborative study with Leuven, Nijmegen in the Netherlands and Czech Republic. Um, so we looked into the obstetrical outcome, the neonatal outcome, general health outcome, and we investigated, examined these children in detail, both neurologically and at the cardiac level. We had 114 children. However, we, we limited the study to children who were at least 18 months of age. Um, there were 85. And then some of these women could not participate, and some women, they really didn't want to come to the hospital again just because of psychological reasons. And at the end, 70 children actually were included in the study. So they received um, cardiological examination, general health examination, um, and we did a neurological examination. At the age of 18 months, this was the Bailey scale. Um, afterwards, the kind of examination depends on the age. So we looked into intelligence, attention, the memory, both verbal and the nonverbal, and we looked into the behavior by the child behavior checklist. And the way or the type of test depends on the age, and they are depicted uh, here. So we had 70 children out of 68 pregnancies. The median gestational age at diagnosis was 18 weeks, and actually we covered 230 cycle, 236 cycles of chemotherapy. The median follow-up of the children was 22 months, but we had two children who were 18 years already. And it was mainly in Belgium, but 20 children from the Netherlands and eight from the Czech Republic. But the same protocol, of course, was used in these three coordinating centers. As what we would accept, uh, or expect is that breast cancer was uh, most common, followed by hematological cancers. Of course, by definition, all women received chemotherapy, but seven women also received radiotherapy, and some women also received surgery. So 236 cycles, but 21 different types of chemotherapy. And you can see at the bottom, it's mainly 5-FU, cyclophosphamide and anthracyclines, which are the cytotoxic drugs during, uh, used during, uh, for breast cancer. So we can only give a rough estimate of uh, chemotherapy, but the data do not allow us to really focus on one type of cytotoxic drug. The median gestational age at birth was 35, seven uh, weeks. Median birth weight was 2,600 gram. And in our study, 20% were intra had intrauterine growth retardation. And as you can see from uh, the, the table, the figure, we see that only 23 children were actually born majorly. And you will see that this has an impact uh, result or impact on the, on the results. At neonatal neurological examination, we had normal findings in 91% of cases. We had five children with a transient hypotonia, benign sleep myoclonus, one child, and one child with a contracture of the right elbow. I'm not a pediatrician, but if I talk to our pedi pediatricians, they say this is, these are symptoms you can see in the general population, and it does not appear to be increased or altered in this study population. Again, there was no increase or any other types of congenital malformations that we uh, saw in this population. Important, because we, sh we have shown that chemotherapy may be correlated to intrauterine growth retardation, these figures show that actually the children catch up. We see for female and male children, weight, height, and head circumference, and we see that the uh, results are well below the 10th and the 9th, actually the 5th and the 59th percentile. So this is reassuring uh, data. Before we continue, I have to say that we had two outliers. 
Um, this was actually a twin pregnancy. It was a mother with acute myeloid leukemia. She received three times chemotherapy at, at 15 weeks, 21 weeks, and 26 weeks. It was a dichorionic, diamniotic twin. However, PPROM at 32 weeks and preterm delivery at 33 weeks. Um, boy and girl uh, intrauterine growth retarded. And actually, they developed normally, but during the first months, actually, the parents started to see some developmental um, retardation. And finally, actually, an autistic disorder, mental and motoric retardation was diagnosed with the boy. And you can see the unilateral polymicrogyria at the MRI. Also, his uh, sister had a delay in neurological development, however, not so severe. We discussed this case in, in detail with our geneticians, pediatricians, neurologists in our university, in another university, and especially the, because also the child was dysmorphic and the fact that there were skill, skin alterations suggest a um, syndromal pattern. And although we cannot define the syndrome, we believe that this was uh, that is more like a syndrome which is not related to chemotherapy. Also, chemotherapy was only administered after 15 weeks. However, we have to report this. We do not believe that chemotherapy has been related to it, but uh, we have to keep this in mind. When we look into the health problems, um, we see that all, so all the other children had many health problems, but we will not go into detail in this list, but actually what you can appreciate from these lists is actually are also the health problems that other children not exposed to chemotherapy will uh, suffer from. We did audiometry in 21 children at the age of 6.5 years. 18 children had actually a normal hearing uh, function. Four children received cisplatin in utero. Cisplatin is notorious for uh, audio toxic, uh, audio toxicity. These children also did good, but of course, these are only four children. We had three children with hearing loss, two the outliers, and one child had hearing loss at high frequencies at six years. CT scan was done, not because of the study, but because of the hearing loss. Um, before the study initiated, and it appeared to be a retracted tympanic membrane, which is actually a sign of chronic otitis. So at least this is a confounding factor. When we look into the cognitive function, we pooled the data on the, in, of the intelligence tests, the Bailey score at 18 months, and the clinical neurological examination. And we can appreciate from this slide that actually most of the children are doing well, and actually most of the children had a normal cognitive function. However, you can appreciate here a smooth balance to the left side, to the worst outcome side. And the reason, therefore, is explained here. Here we see the same uh, data, but divided according to gestational age. And you see in the middle and at the right, so after 34 weeks, there is actually, we see that most children do well and that there is more or less equal um, balance between children who are doing worse and better. So when a child is born mature um, or after 34 weeks, even after chemotherapy, the results are reassuring. However, we see that most of the problems are at the left side. So children born before 34 weeks had a higher uh, incidence to have a lower uh, IQ score. And the same data are actually um, detailed here. Here we see the IQ score versus the pregnancy duration. And this slide shows a correlation between the two. Actually, we found and calculated that the IQ scores increases with 2.5% for each week increase in pregnancy duration. And of course, 2.5 points as such is not so, uh, will not make such a difference. But what was frequently done when we started the study is that pregnancy was, uh, or that delivery or cesarean section was done at two, 32 weeks. Um, but that means two months earlier. So that means that you can, um, that's 2.5 for a week times eight, that's virtually 20 IQ points that your child may lose. So we believe that this is an important message and we, we think that apart from that we would, should not strive to fetal viability but to fetal maturity because of these uh, data. When we look into detail into the behavior, memory, uh, verbal, nonverbal, attention, um, attentional flexibility, I acknowledge that the numbers are not so high but nevertheless these are very detailed examinations and the results are expressed in the Z-score. So everything which is 
between minus 1 and plus 1 is actually a normal score. And you can appreciate here that all the results are actually within these normal limits. Especially the tests on the additional flexibility, they actually request a lot. And although it's not significant, you see that if there is any trend, it's a trend in a positive direction. Not saying that these patients children benefit from chemotherapy, but at least it's reassuring that in the most complex tests, there is a trend towards the uh, good side. Regarding the cardiac data, we did not encounter congenital heart malformations. ECGs were normal, heart diameters were normal, and systolic and diastolic functions were normal. This table gives uh, a summary of children exposed to anthracyclines, and anthracyclines are notorious for their cardiotoxicity. We will not go into detail, don't be afraid, but you can see that all these parameters are actually, that's quite an investigation in detail, and although some tests are uh, significantly uh, different, clinically the differences are not important. So from this point of view, also patients, children exposed to anthracyclines do not appear to have a worse cardiac outcome. Our conclusion of this study is that the child's behavior, general health, hearing, and growth was reported as in general population. Most of the children have an age-adequate neurological development, intelligence, attention, memory, and also cardiac function. We frequently encountered prematurity, and this was associated with an impaired cognitive development. The, clin the implications in the, in the clinic for us are that the fear for chemotherapy as such should not be a reason to terminate pregnancy. There may be other reasons, but fear of chemotherapy should not be one of these. We do not believe that actually the fear for chemotherapy should be a reason to delay maternal treatment, and this was a policy that was frequently applied. And we also believe that it's better to treat a woman with chemotherapy rather than let your child be born premature, uh, prematurely. And for those who uh, do not believe the figures, huh, these are the children that are examined in our study. And as you can see, they are all doing well. For obstetricians, um, we, in our series on overview on, in The Lancet, and I don't think there's any other publication that actually summarizes this. I will not go into detail, but at least there we summarized a checklist of uh, things that an obstetrician should know when a patient gets oncological treatment during pregnancy. For example, regarding timing of delivery, we believe, as shown, that it should be preferably after 37 weeks. If chemotherapy is given, we prefer to have a time frame between chemotherapy and delivery because due to the chemotherapy, there might be hematologic toxicity, might be an increased risk of infection or bleeding during delivery, um, so we prefer to have a quite a good uh, interval between the two. Um, but I refer to this publication if you want to have more uh, details. I've shown you some data on fetal safety, and I acknowledge that we need more data and that we need enlarge the group and we need longer follow-up and we are busy with doing this. But apart from this, it's also important to have a look on the maternal uh, safety. Um, it's a pleasure for me and an honor to give you for the first time at an international uh, scene the results of our data that are submitted to a high-impact journal and we are revising, revising uh, the version uh, at this stage. But summarized, uh, it's a cohort study cohort study, again with the German breast group and our group, only patients with a new diagnosis of invasive breast cancer during pregnancy were uh, included. We did not look anymore to the pregnancy, we only looked to the maternal outcome. And we did do a Cox proportion on um, tumor characteristics, including grade and hormone receptor positivity, HER2 positivity, uh, type of chemotherapy, and the uh, trastuzumab that was given. And this is the most important uh, slide. We see disease-free survival, and we see the overall survival, and I detailed it in red. You see that the hazard ratio is virtually one, indicating that pregnant women with breast cancer do not have an increased risk to die from breast cancer when compared to non-pregnant women. We also looked into subgroups um, regarding hormonal receptor status, molecular subtype, the age, nodal involvement, and type of chemotherapy. But in none of these groups, we could actually detect a difference. So, um, and to put this into a larger perspective, this slide gives an overview of the current studies that are available. And you can see from the second column that our study makes a, is much larger than the available evidence. 
and that we think that we can uh, work on the discrepant results that all the other smaller studies have shown, because some studies showed an equal outcome, other studies showed actually a worse outcome. And we believe that with uh, 368 uh, patients um, with a good control for prognostic factors, suggesting that there is no difference, that these are quite valid data. Regarding chemotherapy again, but also thus about prognosis, you know better than I do that pregnancy is associated with physiological alterations, and these physiological alterations may in fact also uh, affect the effect of chemotherapy. Um, and we have shown this, or at least this dilution, we have shown in the first and at this stage still only study on pharmacokinetics in pregnant women. And you can see, although the numbers are small, but at least for four different types of chemotherapy, paclitaxel, carboblatin, doxorubicin, and ibirubicin, um, we saw at the lowest line an increase in distribution volume, which you would, you would expect, increasing clearance. And the result of this is actually that the CMAX and the area under the curve of these four drugs is actually lower during pregnancy. So chemotherapy is indeed diluted in pregnant women. The big question is, how will this affect the prognosis, of course? So also from the uh, first uh, study that was published in, in August, um, this uh, figure shows that there is actually no difference in women who received chemotherapy during pregnancy or women who received the chemotherapy only after pregnancy. So despite the fact that there is some dilution, at this stage it does not seem to impair the maternal prognosis. So also this is reassuring for our patients. So the key messages from my uh, lecture is that we do not believe that termination of pregnancy will actually improve the prognosis. We believe that the prognosis of the mother is similar. We believe that the standard treatment of, should, be, should also be given to pregnant women as much as possible, and we believe that with some certain restrictions, but that chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery are possible during pregnancy. Important is, and I hope you are convinced, that the prevention of prematurity is really important, and many or little of us have actually a vast experience, so please take time, and if needed, for a second uh, opinion. I have shown you mainly the positive sides, and I also want to be realistic and to show you, for example, a single case that we were confronted with. Um, it was young women with a high-grade sarcoma, as you can appreciate from the uh, lower at the back, and the complete abdomen was actually filled with tumor. And despite the fact that we have better insights and that we know better how to treat these women, in some cases we are with, the back, with our back against the wall and we are not uh, able to actually save maternal and fetal life. If you're more interested, we have a website. There's a part of the website which is in English. You can refer also your, your patients to the, to the website. Um, as told in the introduction, I'm chairing a European uh, task force on this topic. Um, actually, we're dealing with more um, researchers. At this stage, regarding the follow-up of the children, we have five centers are, who are participating. But as you can see, Ireland is not there, and there's no Irish representative in the group, so this is also an invitation for you to have an Irish repre representative in our European task force. I have to acknowledge a lot of people. These are the most important ones in Leuven, but also Nijmegen, Czech Republic, and uh, Toronto, where we collaborate for the cardiac examinations. Thank you for your attention.